All right, ASL Physics, welcome to part two of Simple Harmonic Motion, where we're going to talk about the graphs of Simple Harmonic Motion, which we did before we went on the break, just a little bit. Okay, so you can see here on the right-hand side, we have a guy swinging on a pendulum. That's your classic pendulum motion or Simple Harmonic Motion, where we have our equilibrium. Oh, let's just change the color there. We have our equilibrium position about the middle there. Okay, and he's oscillating back and forth about that. So just to review, the main characteristics of simple harmonic motion are you got to have a restoring force. Okay, so I got a restoring force trying to pull the guy back to the equilibrium position. So if he's on that side, it's pulling back. Okay, so in order to have a restoring force, the system must have an equilibrium set up. And then a disturbance, such as me pushing the guy to the left or the right, is going to disturb the system from equilibrium, which is going to create a restoring force to bring him back, okay? So by me pushing the person, I'm giving energy into the system, okay? And the system is acting a force to bring it back to equilibrium. So that brings us to the, the point that oscillations have to have an equilibrium position. We talked about this important point, that acceleration is proportional to negative x. So if the guy is moving to the left, okay, the acceleration is going to be back to the equilibrium position. It's always opposing the motion of the person. Okay, the period and amplitude, which is what we're going to talk about today, for something that's exhibiting true simple harmonic motion, the period and amplitude are constant. They're not changing. Okay, if the object is swaying randomly or its period is going slower and faster, it's not true simple harmonic motion. There's something else happening in that system. Okay, so if I see a styrofoam floating in water bobbing up and down and it's constant period that's true simple harmonic motion and we can model it pretty simply okay uh, the period is independent of the amplitude so that means that if i swung the guy five centimeters versus 10 centimeters or versus two meters the period is always going to be the same that that was a unique thing that galileo saw when he was looking at pendulums Okay, and then the last thing which we're going to look at today is the displacement velocity acceleration graphs over time always exhibit a sine and cosine function. And you guys did that as an activity in class before we went. So at, at, when you guys used uh, video analysis to graph simple harmonic motion, your graphs looked like this. This is a classic sine curve. Okay, in order for me to get a sine curve from the motion of this dude, Okay, I'd have to start graphing him when he's just moving from the equilibrium position. Okay, it seems like the video stops when he gets to the equilibrium position anyway. Okay, now in this case, the graph is showing him moving to the right, okay, to the positive displacement. And if I was to graph his displacement over time, I would see that he is slowing down and comes to a stop at the amplitude. That's because the acceleration is in the opposite direction. Then he speeds up goes to the equilibrium position, slows down, and stops in the negative position, okay? And he makes this typical sine graph, okay? So for the higher levels, they're going to have to be able to use sine and cosine functions to predict exactly where on that graph the, the guy is going to be at a certain amount of time, okay? Now, just to remind you what period is, the period is the time to complete one full cycle. So if I started here, it would be the time it takes for me to go to here, okay? I'm ending at the exact same point that I started. So if I started here, my period would be here, that the time it takes to, to complete that one full cycle, okay? And frequency is one divided by the period. So if I measured the period on the graph, just take the inverse of that one divided by the period will give me the frequency, okay? The velocity from this graph would be the slope or the tangent at any of these points, okay? So if I was to make a velocity graph from this, Okay, so if I had velocity over time, okay, at this point over here, I'm going to have my maximum positive velocity. So it would start over here. So my velocity graph looks something like this. Okay, now the, re the rest of this over here, I didn't match up with the graph above, but we can take a look at the beginning. I'd have my maximum velocity at that point. My velocity here would be zero. Okay, because the object is coming to a stop and the tangent there, the tangent of that graph is zero. And then I'd have maximum negative velocity at that point over here. Okay, and then it would be coming to a stop at that point. So this should be over here. That's not really matched up. Okay, so just imagine this whole thing has shifted a bit to the right. So that would be my velocity graph. And that my velocity graph using that displacement graph is actually a cosine 
So what, one thing you'll learn in mathematics and calculus is if I take the derivative of a displacement time graph, that'll give me a velocity time graph. So a derivative of a sine function is equal to a cosine function, for those of you who are doing that in math right now. That's pretty neat, okay? And then if I took the slope of this graph, what does the slope of that graph mean? The slope is the change in velocity over time, so that would give me my acceleration over time graph, okay? So that's how we can initially graph the displacement over time of something oscillating, and then from that graph we can determine some important characteristics, okay? Just to remind you, important characteristics are amplitude, okay? The, dis the maximum displacement from the equilibrium, Okay, my period, the time it takes to complete one full cycle. My frequency, which is one divided by my period. Okay, velocity, which is the slope at any point on that graph. So you'd have to physically calculate the slope of that line if they asked you that. Okay, and then you should be comfortable transforming the shapes of these graphs. That can be an SL question pretty easily. Okay, not doing calculations, but looking at the shapes of those graphs. Okay, so one graph I want to focus in on right now is the acceleration displacement graph. Okay, so like I said, one characteristic of simple harmonic motion is that the acceleration is proportional to the negative displacement. It means that the acceleration is always opposite in direction of the displacement. And if I was to graph the acceleration of this, okay, that's versus time, but if I was to take the acceleration and, uh, and look at the displacement, I would get this graph. It's a linear graph, and it always has that shape. So if my displacement is negative, my acceleration is positive. My acceleration of the object is going to be maximum as I get towards that displacement. Why maximum? Because it's going to cause the object to stop in its pendulum swing, okay? And then it's going to bring the object back to equilibrium and stop it. So it'll be a negative acceleration as it passes the equilibrium to stop the object. And then that would that type of acceleration would cause an object to oscillate, okay? Notice that at that equilibrium position, my acceleration is zero. So when the pendulum goes through the middle, my acceleration is zero, okay? So I'm gonna have maximum acceleration in the opposite direction at those amplitudes, okay? That's an important thing to think about. All right, so great. If I'm able to calculate my acceleration, I can do a lot of interesting things in the higher level section, which the higher level students are gonna go deeper into. But for us, we just have to understand in general what the shapes of these graphs look like and how to apply it. Okay, now one thing in your problem sets that I want you to get used to doing because you're gonna to have to come back to it anyway. We talked about something in circular motion called angular frequency, okay? So when I'm looking at a graphs of motion that are in sine, sine curves or I'm looking at a circular motion, it's much more easy, easier for me to measure the motion in terms of change in angle than instead of change in distance because sometimes if something is spinning or oscillating so fast, it becomes a blur. So it's easier, me, easier for me to calculate the time it takes per oscillation or calculate the total number of oscillations rather than the actual speed of the object that's oscillating. So we use terms such as angular frequency. Now the angular frequency is in one cycle, so one cycle of a pendulum going back and forth, it would complete one full circle. And in terms of one full circle, in terms of the angle of that, that would be two pi radians. Two pi radians is one full circle. So my angular frequency would be the number of radians that I complete over time, okay? So angular frequency is equal to radians per second, okay? Sometimes they'll call that angular velocity. And I can measure how many cycles something goes in a certain amount of time and be able to work backwards to get this value, to get angular frequency. And if I get angular frequency, that's the key, that's the key to me solving problems with uh, simple harmonic motion in the higher level course. I need to find the angular frequency and once I have the angular frequency I can apply it into sine or cosine functions to figure out where objects are going. But for the SL unit and for your dot point problems you also have to be able to do this. Okay, I gave it to you as a challenge. Okay, so once I got the angular frequency I can easily turn angular frequency into velocity. So the velocity of the object at any of these points that it, that's moving along that x-axis, that velocity I can calculate by multiplying my angular frequency times the displacement at that point. Okay, so my angular frequency times the displacement at that point is going to give me the velocity at that point. Okay, um, the easy way of thinking that is 2 times pi times r gives me my circumference, or it gives me my arc length for that point divided by the period or the time it takes for that arc length to be created 
is going to give me my velocity. Okay, that makes sense. 2 pi r is meters, meters over seconds is velocity. On the other hand, I can calculate my acceleration of the object at any of those points. As long as I know my angular frequency, which is constant for an object going undergoing simple harmonic motion, if I square my, oops, if I square my angular frequency, all right, if I square the angular frequency and I multiply by the displacement at that point, that will give me my acceleration. Now this is a very important